Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Book Award finalists reading. I'm Deborah Landau, director of NYU's Creative Writing Program, and we are delighted to be hosting the National Book Awards finalists reading at NYU for the second consecutive year. It's a privilege to be able to help showcase and celebrate the vital power of writing and books, and I'd like to thank the National Book Foundation for entrusting us with this honor. On a personal note, this is especially sweet as NYU has been proud to see so many in our community receive National Book Awards over the years, including most recently alumni Robin Cost Lewis, Tess Gunty, and John Keane. Warmest thanks to Skirball for this elegant space. Immense gratitude to President Linda Mills and Interim Provost Gigi Dopico for their generous support. Special thanks also to Ryan Pointer and Joanna Yaz for helping to make tonight possible. And to all our friends at the National Book Foundation, thank you. I'd like to extend my warmest congratulations to the finalists on this extraordinary achievement. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Ruth Dickey, Executive Director of the National Book Foundation. Thank you so much. Good evening and welcome to the 2023 National Book Award finalist reading. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you to the many amazing people at the Office of the Provost, NYU Skirball, and NYU Creative Writing Program, especially Deborah and Joanna Yass, and our gold sponsor, Penguin Random House, for making this evening possible. Thanks, too, to the wonderful staff and volunteers at the National Book Foundation, most especially our awards and honors manager, Madeline Shelton, tonight's ASL interpreters, Kim Hale and Miriam Roquefort, Tonight's protactile interpreters, Aihi Kode, Haline Anderson, Maria Becerra, Helica Nuxio, Christina Hartman, and Christina Hartman. Our photographer, Beowulf Sheehan, and really useful media, the incredible production team broadcasting both tonight's programs and tomorrow's National Book Awards ceremony for readers everywhere. Let's have a round of applause for all those amazing folks. Tonight we're gathered, the evening before the 74th National Book Awards, to celebrate the 2023 National Book Award finalists. Thank you all so much for joining us on this special occasion, and please join me in also giving these authors and translators a huge round of applause. In this especially difficult moment, as in so many difficult moments throughout our history, I feel grateful and privileged for the opportunity to celebrate stories and the rich tapestry of characters, places, and points of view that we all have the opportunity to bear witness to tonight. Tonight's program is about opening up the National Book Awards doors to as many people as possible in person and online, and taking a moment to revel in the words of our finalists brought to life on stage. We'll get to hear from the work of 30 authors and translators from a total of 25 finalist books, including excerpts from translated literature finalists read both in their original languages and in their English translations. I'd like to take a moment to recognize two finalists who were unable to join us this evening and the special guests reading in their stead. Matteo Ascaripor will be reading on behalf of Lucy Scott, translator of On a Woman's Madness. And Teju Cole will be reading on behalf of Raja Shahade, author of We Could Have Been Friends, My Father and I, a Palestinian memoir. Thank you, Lucy and Raja, for your important, irreplaceable work. And thank you, Mateo and Teju, for holding space for Lucy and Raja's words tonight. While the celebration is the most visible aspect of the awards, the awards also represent an immense amount of work. We are forever indebted to our 2023 National Book Award judges who read over 1,931 book submissions this year. And somehow, I know, right? They do deserve a round of applause. 
somehow, some way, they narrowed that list down to 25 finalists in the categories of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, translated literature, and young people's literature. These finalists represent some of the most remarkable literature being published today, and we are their lucky readers. Tomorrow, we will gather for the 74th National Book Awards ceremony hosted by LeVar Burton and featuring special guest Oprah Winfrey. We'll recognize our Lifetime Achievement honorees, Rita Dove and Paul Yamazaki. And of course, the award ceremony is also where our 2023 National Book Award winners will be announced live on stage. If you haven't already made your plans to tune in, you still have time to register and join us for the broadcast at our website at nationalbook.org backslash awards. Our National Book Awards Week's programming is both a culmination and a beginning. We at the National Book Foundation work year-round to connect these books and all our National Book Foundation honored titles to hundreds of thousands of readers across the country. We present educational and public programming in nearly all 50 states. We partner with public libraries, schools, cultural centers, and book festivals to host book clubs, present free, timely literary programming to readers of all ages, and distribute publisher-donated books to children and families living in 56 public housing communities across 34 states. We recognize debut authors through Five Under 35 and highlight topical programs like science and literature. The work we do every day begins and ends with a love of books. If you believe as much as we do in the connective power of literature, you can support our work by scanning the QR code on your program insert or visiting our website at nationalbook.org slash give. The 25 2023 National Book Award finalists are made up of a myriad of genres, forms, and voices. Tonight, each book's container will be opened and words and worlds will come to life. Thank you to these authors and translators and the many, many people who made these books possible. Your words have already enriched our lives and we know will continue to enrich the lives of readers everywhere. We are also grateful to the NYU Bookstore who are selling all 25 titles for us right outside these doors in the lobby. So if you haven't already an intermission, please buy yourself at least one copy of each book uh, or you can also do so following the program. And now I'm honored to turn things over to our fantastic host for the evening, Parl Sagal. Parle is a staff writer at The New Yorker. She was previously a book critic at The New York Times, where she also worked as a senior editor and columnist. She teaches in the Graduate Creative Writing Program at New York University, and we're tremendously lucky to have her joining us tonight. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Hi. Welcome to the 2023 National Book Award finalist reading. I'm honored to be your host for the evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Tonight we're celebrating the authors and translators of 25 outstanding works in fiction, nonfiction, poetry, translated literature, and young people's literature, which we'll have the pleasure of hearing in their own voices and the voices of our special guests. We will hear from each of the finalists by categories starting with young people's literature and ending with fiction. There will be a brief 10 minute intermission after the translated literature finalists. For the translated literature category, the first reader will read a passage in the original language, which means that tonight we'll hear texts in Dutch, French, Korean, Portuguese, and Spanish. The next reader will then read the same passage in English. Throughout the night, I will introduce each reader by name and groups, finalists, as I call your name, please stand in your seat and face the audience for a round of applause. And then finalists, you may be seated and you'll go up on the stage one by one or groups in alphabetical order. A friendly reminder to silence your cell phones. Now, let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce the finalists for the 2023 National Book Award for Young People's Literature. Kenneth Cadeau. Huda Fami, (laughs) 
Vashti Harrison, Catherine Marsh, and Dan Santat. So, Gather um, is a dog. Ian is a, a kid who has got his heart set on adopting this dog. So that's the context. <laughs> so I'm standing there trying to suck it up when he comes around the corner with an apple in his mouth. I guess I might have got a little choked up. I don't know where you came from, but I sure do hope you stay, I told him. I thought I'd name him Hunter at first, since he knew how to take care of himself. But since he, was, since he was eating mostly vegetables, he found on his own, well, that's how I came to name him Gather. So something I have to say is about the word gather. It means a lot of things, like gathering food, gathering your thoughts. When somebody who listens, somebody like the Sharp, when she asks you what it's like to grow, the, grow up the way you're growing up, you gather together all these parts of your life and all these stories of things from way before. Things that get mixed up with what's happening right then. Those stories don't come out like a goddamn timeline. They come out like compost. All the leaves, the coffee grounds, fireplace ashes, apple cores, tea bags, onion skins, eggshells, corn husks, potato peels, everything that turned to dirt at one time or another, doesn't matter when. It belongs with whatever you've got growing out of it right there in front of you. Doesn't matter either if you're talking about sugar snap peas, tomatoes, pumpkins, or weeds. You can't go pulling all the dirt away from the roots, trying to put it into some kind of order so you can understand it your way. You kill it if you do that. Stories we tell come out like the way you walk the woods if you want to know it. Zigzagging, doubling back, maybe tripling. Sometimes enough to find out that the parts you know the least about are the parts closest to home. You don't just make some frigging beeline to some hill like you're trying to get your steps in. I just don't understand people like that. I don't think they're from around here. But I feel like you need to understand this. Our stories from around here come out like the way we keep our work shed. You go in there, see what you have lying around, some of it being old as hell some of it being stuff you might have even had the money to buy for yourself. You move something, you find something else. You brush it off a little, then you use it or you set it back down. But you need it all to piece together how things come to be the way they are now, how you come to be who you are. And then when things go to hell in your own life, the word gather means something else all over again. Because there's a lot of good people, some who you know, some who you only just met. And the ones who matter, they listen. They gather on your side, and at least they try to help you, even if it might not work out. I know that for a fact. All that being said, I am definitely getting ahead of myself here. Right then, I was just goddamn glad to have that dog. Thank you. I just hope that the slides will show up. Okay, great. Um, so Huda and her sisters have just been called into a family meeting and it could go either way and they don't know. And here we start uh, with their father. I have some very big news. Mom is pregnant? What? No, you sit down. Oh, absolutely not. What's the one thing you're always asking for? A lawnmower that isn't from the 1800s? A dishwasher that actually works? A professional chef and cleaning lady? Why are you guessing? You already know what it is. I can dream. You all know I started a job a few months ago, and along with a company car and a company phone, I was also given access to a company timeshare. Cricket, cricket. In Florida! Okay. 
Mayor Disney World. <laughs> We're going to Disney World. <laughs> what? Yes! Wow! No way! That's more like it. I was this close to canceling the whole thing. Yeah! How the F is ecstatic! Yay, 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 yay! That means we're finally going on a plane! Even better! We're going on to make it a road trip. What? But Disney World is in Florida. If we're driving, that's... Yup, a 24-hour drive. I'm out. Oh, stop being dramatic. Is your selective memory acting up? I don't know what you're talking about. Yesterday, 5 a.m., Wake up! It's time for Fedger. Splash! Blah, blah, blah. 11 a.m. I'm gonna start walking like this, so whoever's in my way is gonna get kicked! And 2 p.m. I grabbed the remote first! I called it first! Get off! 5 p.m. Time to clear off the table, put the food away, and do the dishes. Let's go! Screech! Poof. I gotta pee! I'm feeling sick! I got homework! <laughs> True story. <laughs> We can barely stand 24 hours together in the house. Imagine what 24 hours together in the van is gonna be like. <sighs> okay, but it's friggin' Disney World. The happiest place on earth, it's gonna be different. I don't know, I just can't help feeling like this is a trap to make us bond as sisters. Stop overthinking it. A road trip is exactly what you all need to bond as sisters. Trap! <laughs> well, except Amani, she's got her Quran intensive that week. Yes. Studying the Qur'an with Tajweed, understanding with Tafsir, and I'll be staying with Tete and Jitto, best summer ever. I love this for you, I really do. But that means Amani isn't going to get to bond with us, and that's just not fair. Well, you're more than welcome to join her at the Qur'an intensive. We'll send you a postcard. <laughs> Great, and Amani was the only one we actually got along with. You just think that because she laughs at all our jokes. Exactly. She's clearly the sister with the best taste. It's going to be fine. You'll see. The strip is going to rock. <laughs> I don't understand why we couldn't take Mama's van. It's bigger. You mean your mom's van that's so busted when it was stolen, the car thieves brought it back with an apology and a full tank of gas? We still use the knife they jammed into the ignition to start the van. Okay, so there's not as much space as anticipated. A small setback, no big deal. Yeah, ugh, I'm sure the rest of the trip will go great. Hour one. <laughs> Stop breathing on me. I'm not. Mama, what is breathing on me? I'm only breathing. I can't stop breathing. Why don't you give it a try? <laughs> <laughs> Hour two. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Who was that? Sorry, guys. I just wrote an article. You what? It's what I'm calling my farts now. I'm trying to be more discreet. <laughs> well, your article stinks. Yeah, wait till we're outside before you publish another one. <laughs> hey, I can't stop breaking news. You mean breaking wind? Oh, wait, this just in. <laughs> Open a window! Open a window! Thank you. <laughs> was so funny and my book is not as funny it's <laughs> I'm so sorry <laughs> this is big written and illustrated by me Vashti Harrison once there was a girl with a big laugh and a big heart and very big dreams she learned her ABC's and one two threes she always said please and thank you, and even put away all her toys. At dinner, she ate all her food. What a big girl you are, the adults would say. And it was good. She grew and learned and laughed and dreamed, and grew and grew and grew. And it was good. Until it wasn't. Not a lot of words in this book, so we're going to look closely at the pictures. Looks like here she is trying on dresses. And here she's with Santa. Santa's saying, you're a big girl, aren't you? Here she is at school. One day, something big happened. Looks like she's playing on the playground with her friends. 
Her friends are saying, I can't wait for the recital. I'm going to be a rose. I'm going to be a daisy. And what she's saying, oh no. Look, she's stuck. OMG, ha ha ha. Moo, whale. More like moose. And now she's saying, help. Looks like her teacher is here trying to pull her out and they fell. Her teacher saying, don't you think you're too big for that? You could have hurt someone. You should know better. Those are for the little kids. You're in big trouble. It made her feel small. The words stung and were hard to shake off. She began to feel not herself, out of place, exposed, judged, yet invisible. Everyone had advice, but that kind of hurt too. Looks like her dance instructor is saying, hmm, that's no good. Try this instead. This is perfect for you. You're just too big. The flower costume won't fit. Where are you going? What did I say? Not a lot of words left. Looks like she ran and found a corner to hide in. And something's happening. Something's changing. You can really see it when we look at the book. It's almost like she's kind of stuck on this side of the page. So what do you think is gonna happen next? She fell over. And now she's struggling. And now, even in this sad moment, these people are walking by and they're saying, aren't you too big to be crying? Have you tried being smaller? Why can't you just fit in? One day, she finally let it all out. Looks like there's something coming out in her tears. She started to see things more clearly. Looks like she's looking at one of those words. She decided to make more space for herself. How is she gonna do that? You can't see it up there, but you can really see it here. She decided to make more space for herself and was e able to see a way out. What do you think is on the other side there, on the way out? Some of those people, she's handing something to them and she's saying, these are yours, they hurt me but it looks like she's holding on to something as well. Some of those other words. Not everyone understood or even listened. It's just a joke. It's not that serious. You're too sensitive. Some tried. I didn't mean to hurt you, but they still couldn't see that she was just a girl. I can help you change if you want. But what does she say? No, thank you. I like the way I am. And she was good. And a bunch of other things. Um, very briefly, that is the end, thank you. I'm gonna very briefly read the author's note here for you. In, this is the author's note. In childhood, big is good, big is impressive aspirational, but somewhere along the way, the world begins to tell us something different, that big is bad, that being big is undesirable. I was never a dancer, but I did get stuck in a swing when I was younger. Some of the older kids and I were playing on the baby swings and I couldn't get out. I was the only one to get into trouble. My size indicated to adults that I was big enough to know better, even though I was still just a kid. 
I learned that day that my body did not fit, it did not belong, and adults no longer saw me as a little girl who could make innocent mistakes. While my experience was far less overt than the one in this book, the thoughts and words at work are the same. A child sits in the crosshairs of adultification bias and anti-fat bias. She's subjected to judgments and prejudices that are harmful and have lasting effects. Still, she finds enough self-love to return the words that were unkind and unhelpful. I hope she will stand as a guide to all who need to see her journey, especially those of us who are black girls in big bodies. There's more, but you can check it out. Thank you. Hello, I am Katherine Marsh, author of The Lost Year. The Lost Year is a book about three cousins, two of them in 1930s Ukraine and one of them in Brooklyn, who are separated by history, by famine, by disinformation, and by immigration. I'm gonna read a short passage. This past winter, everything was different. People stayed inside, away from one another, hiding what little food they had. The village was absolutely silent. Usually, even in winter time, you'd hear a dog barking or the clop of horses' hooves. But people had eaten all the cats and dogs and horses and even the birds. I couldn't help recoiling at the thought of people eating their pets. Nadia's eyes flashed. You can stand there and make a face, but if you had been there, you would have done it too. We were starving. Forgive me, I murmured, but I couldn't shake off my horror. Mama thought about leaving, taking us to Kiev or north to Russia, where people said there was no famine, but it was impossible to buy train tickets and the new system of passports made it illegal to leave. Mama traded her wedding ring for some bread at the Turgzin shop in Bielitserkva, walked 10 miles each way through the snow. But we quickly devoured the loaves she brought home and she had nothing else to trade. We were so hungry, Mila. We had no energy to play, to work, to do anything, even cry. Just lie there in a stupor, and think about food. Mama and I ate less, gave the boys more, but it still wasn't enough. They were younger, weaker. Nadia began to sob. I rushed to embrace her. Uh, Antin died first, she choked out. He always slept next to me. February 9th, I woke up. He was already cold. I screamed, but what could Mama do? She closed his eyes, made the cross over him. Mikola was too tired to cry. The next evening, he died in Mama's arms. By this time, I was crying too. These boys were my cousins, my flesh and blood, and Papa had done nothing but turn his back on them. I'm sorry, I whispered. I'm sorry. For what? The state starved our family, murdered them, Nadia said. What could you have done, even as a child of privilege? Nothing. But Papa was the state, and I had been eating chocolates while my cousins starved. I had a sudden crazy urge to run off to Bilitserkva with all the food I could carry, but I'd be stopped, maybe even arrested. Nadia was right. There was nothing I could do, or almost nothing. Someday. Will you show me their graves? I whispered. That's the thing. Nadia's voice broke. We couldn't even bury them properly. No one had the strength to dig graves, so we buried them in a common one. Mama wasn't right after that. She hardly ate, giving me what scraps we had left. Lomachenko, <laughs> she said one night with a bitter laugh. Even our name means scrap. Nadia's eyes met mine. 
You know that, don't you? Lum is a scrap. I'd never thought about it, I said. I'd never thought about any of this. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Dan Santat. I'm going to be reading from my graphic novel memoir, A First Time for Everything. Uh, just some back context. Uh, it was, takes place in 1989, I was 13 years old, uh, and there was this terrible incident that happened to me uh, in eighth grade where I was forced to do a speech uh, spring morning uh, by A.A. A. Milne in front of the entire junior high school. And I think we can all understand how terrible junior high was, and we can probably guess how this transpired. Um, I did not do very well, and as a result, I, I suffered a lot of uh, emotional scars. Um, and I grew up in a very white, uh, conservative, small Christian town where I was one of a handful of Asian kids. And my, my mother thought it would be a wonderful experience for me to maybe spend the summer on a three-week trip to Europe with that teacher who was the one that made me go in front of all those kids in that gymnasium. Uh, her name was Marilyn Bjork. <laughs> so, here is a scene where we are in London and she is going to make amends. Last day of the trip, Earl's Court. I can't believe it's the last day already. Yeah, the time fly flew by so fast. What do you want to do today? Whatever. Mr. Santat, I was wondering if you would like to come walk with me. I want to show you something, not far. I promise, it's something you want to see. Sure. And so, 10 minutes later, we walked to this place. I thought about what you said to me in Vienna and how that speech in front of all the kids really affected you. I wanted to make it right. And she takes me to the home of A.A. A. Milne. He was one of my favorite writers. He wrote Spring Morning. I never would have guessed a famous author lived down some random street so close to our hotel in Chelsea. Do you want to hear one of my favorite lines of his? Sure. How lucky am I to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard? That's beautiful. It's from Winnie the Pooh. He actually hated the fact that he was best known for it. He wanted to be taken more seriously as an adult writer. Spring Morning was one of his adult works. The poem is about the unexpectedness of the world and facing it unafraid. Why are you telling me this? Because I want you to be at peace with yourself. Before high school starts, I want you to forget everything that happened in junior high. Start fresh and don't be afraid of the unexpected. You know what the best part of being a teenager is? What? You only have to do it once. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the finalists for the 2023 National Book Award for Translated Literature, Bora Chung and Anton Herr. <laughs> David Diop and Sam Taylor. Stenio Gardel and Bruna Dantas Lobato. Pilar Quintana and Lisa Dillman. And Astrid Romer and Mateo Scaripur reading on behalf of Lucy Scott.
Hi, uh, my name is Bora Chung, and I wrote that book in Korean. This is very scary. Um, it's a collection of 10 stories, so I'm uh, just, I'm only reading one of them. Um, I thought I sh chose a very short passage. It's three and a half pages. I don't know what happened. Um, I'll be very fast. Uh, <laughs> The, the title is The Ruler of Wind and Sand. 공주는 울었다. 너무나 목이 말라서 목구멍이 쩍쩍 갈라질 것만 같고 몸에 물기라고는 한 방울도 남지 않은 느낌인데 어디서 눈물이 나오는지 알수 없었다. 공주는 모래 속에서 파내려던 단단한 것에 머리를 기대고 울었다. 무섭고 춥고 목이 말랐다. 이대로 모래 사막에서 죽게 될 것이라고 공주는 생각했다. 아침이 오는 것을 다시는 보지 못할 것이다. 해가 뜨는 광경을 다시는 보지 못할 것이다. 궁에서 자신을 하염없이 기다릴 눈마와 왕자도 다시는 보지 못할 것이다. 태어나 자란 초원도 부모님도 다시는 보지 못할 것이다. 이대로 죽어 모래 속에 파묻히면 아무도 자신의 시체조차 찾아내지 못할 것이다. 그렇게 생각하며 공주는 울었다. 흐느낌이 통곡으로 변하고 공주는 사막의 밤하늘 아래 모래 속에서 튀어나온 정체불명의 돌덩어리를 붙잡고 이 말을 기댄 채 마음껏 소리치며 비명을 지르며 울었다. 공주가 이 말을 기댄 뭉툭한 돌덩어리가 공주의 눈물에 흠뻑 젖었다. 공주는 계속 울었다. 공주가 이 말을 기대고 있던 돌덩어리가 움직였다. 공주는 소스라치게 놀랐다. 울음이 저절로 멈추었다. 모래 속에서 거대한 물고기가 몸부림쳤다. I'm going to read slower because <sighs> this is the opportunity of a lifetime, and let's face it, <laughs> when am I going to be up here again? <laughs> All right. Hello, you two. OK. The princess wept. Her throat was so dry that it felt like it was splitting into pieces, and there was not a drop of liquid in her body. But amazingly, there were still tears coming out of her eyes. Leaning against the huge thing she had been digging out, the princess let her tears flow. She was scared, cold, and unbelievably thirsty. I am going to die in the desert, she thought. She would never see the morning again, or the sunrise. Never again would she behold the blind prince desperately waiting for her in the palace, the grassy plains she had been born and raised on, her parents. She would die, sink into the sand, and her body would never be found. The thought made her cry even harder. Her tears became wails, and the princess threw herself upon the mysterious object in the middle of the desert, screaming her grief out into the desert night underneath the stars. The bulky thing she had been leaning her forehead on was soon drenched in her tears. She continued to cry. The object her forehead was leaning on against moved. She threw herself back in surprise. Her tears stopped. A giant fish was flailing in the sands. The princess was so shocked, she started stumbling backwards before falling on her behind. The thing protruding from the sand was the head of a fish. Even in the dim light of the moon, she could clearly make up the milky film clouding over a single eye. When the rains fall on the desert, release a blind fish into the sea. The princess came to her senses. She immediately began to dig out the flailing fish from the sands. Just a moment ago, she had been exhausted and crying, but a strength she had not known she possessed now flowed through her. She furiously attacked the sand, first exposing the gills, then the back fin, and soon the body. After she had excavated the tail, the princess cautiously touched the fish's eye. With the gentlest brush of her fingertips, the thin, hard film over the eye shattered into flakes. The fish swung its tail widely. It launched itself from the sands into the cold night sky, the moment it leaped for the sprinkling of stars against deep indigo, the princess heard a sound as if the night sky, clear as glass, was shattering. Rain began to fall. Water poured from the cracks in the sky. The princess got to her feet as cold, fresh water drenched her whole body. She opened her mouth to the rain and drank it all in. Even when her thirst was quenched many times over, she spread her arms to the sky and kept drinking in the rain, dancing with joy. The blind fish had returned to the vast sea, and rain fell from the desert sky. The princess was elated. Her fear of death, her homesickness, it was all forgotten. Who she was, why she was in the middle of the desert, she was so overjoyed that she forgot it all. And the princess woke from her sleep. Far away, she saw the gates of the palace. Thank you.
Bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Michel Adanson est un botaniste du XVIIIe siècle. Michel Adanson was a botanist from the 18th century. Qui est un des premiers savants à avoir uh, visité le Sénégal en Afrique de l'Ouest. Who was one of the first scientists to visit Senegal in West Africa. Je vais lire. J'ai quitté Paris pour l'île de Saint-Louis du Sénégal à l'âge de 23 ans. Comme d'autres en poésie ou d'autres encore dans les finances ou la politique, je voulais me faire un nom dans la science botanique. Mais pour une raison que je ne soupçonnais pas, malgré son évidence, il ne s'est pas passé ce que j'avais prévu. J'ai fait ce voyage au Sénégal pour découvrir des plantes et j'y ai rencontré des hommes. Nous sommes les fruits de notre éducation et comme tous ceux qui m'avaient décrit l'ordre du monde, j'ai cru de bonne foi que ce qu'ils m'avaient expliqué de la sauvagerie des nègres était vrai. Pourquoi aurais-je mis en doute la parole de maîtres que je respectais, héritiers eux-mêmes de maîtres qui leur avaient assuré que les nègres étaient incultes et cruels La religion catholique dont j'ai failli devenir un serviteur, enseigne que les nègres sont naturellement esclaves. Toutefois, si les nègres sont esclaves, je sais parfaitement qu'ils ne le sont pas par décret divin, mais bien parce qu'il convient de le penser pour continuer de les vendre sans remords. Je suis donc parti au Sénégal à la recherche des plantes, des fleurs, des coquillages, et des arbres qu'aucun autre savant européen n'avait décrit jusqu'à d'or. Et j'y ai rencontré des souffrances. I left Paris for the island of Saint-Louis in Senegal at the age of 23. While others sought to make a name for themselves in poetry, finance and politics, I wanted to do the same in the science of botany. But for a reason I did not suspect, despite its obviousness, things did not go the way I planned. I made that voyage to Senegal to discover plants, and instead I encountered people. We are each the fruit of our education, and like all those who described to me the order of the world, I genuinely believed what I had been told about the savagery of black people was true. Why would I have questioned the word of teachers I respected, themselves the heirs of teachers who had assured them that Africans were ignorant and cruel? The Catholic religion, of which I almost became a servant, teaches that it is natural for black people to be slaves. I know perfectly well, however, that they are slaves not by some divine decree, but because it is convenient to think that way, so that we can go on selling them without qualms. So I left for Senegal in search of plants, flowers, shells, and trees that no other European scientist had yet described. And what I encountered there was suffering. Hi everyone, I'm Stenio Gardel, and uh, this is from A Palavra Que Resta. Raimundo Gaudêncio de Freitas, traço incerto, arredio ao toque do papel, lápis danado, domado, e ele escrevia o nome completo pela primeira vez. 71 anos e essa invenção, como ele diz, de aprender a ler e escrever depois de velho. Raimundo não foi difícil. Complicado era Gaudêncio, denso de saudade, as cinco vogais se acentuado. Freitas era feito de sangue. A vontade tinha sim, desde menino, mas o pai lhe dizia que a letra era para menino que não precisava encher o próprio prato. Raimundo foi cedo para a lida. De noite, o braço ritmado no golpe da foice pedia descanso, 
que no outro dia tinha mais. O intento de aprender se rendeu à precisão. O futuro estava escrito na frente dele, era o presente do pai, pai de família, dono de um pedaço de chão, assinando com o dedo quando a palavra falada não bastasse. O que não podia ser falado, ficasse palavra muda, pensamento. Raimundo não virou pai de família, nem dono de sítio. Se arrancou as raízes, levando no bolso da camisa a carta. Uma carta inteira, uma palavra seguindo a outra. Quantas palavras? Mandar carta para uma pessoa que não sabia ler, só sendo. A ponta do lápis pairou acima da linha. O próximo nome tinha escrito a carta 52 anos antes. Ao lado do caderno, o envelope encruado, sempre fechado. Raimundo não deixou ninguém ler. Envelheceu com o desejo de saber o que ela diz, crescendo dentro dele. Feto idoso, rebento tardio, a carta guardava uma vida inteira. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is from the words that remain. Raimundo Gaudencio de Freitas, in a tentative stroke, barely touching the paper, he tamed that damn pencil and wrote, for the first time, his full name. 71 years old, and he starts getting ideas, as he likes to say, about learning to read and write as an old man. Raimundo came easy, but Gaudencio was complicated, dense with longing, with its five vowels and an accent, Freitas was made of blood. Not for lack of wanting, ever since he was a boy, but his father said writing was for people who don't need to put food on the table. Raimundo went to work young. At night, his arm, tuned to the rhythm of the scythe, needed rest. There was more the next day. His desire to learn slowly gave way to need. His future was written out in front of him, a gift from his father, a family man who owned a bit of land, who signed with a thumbprint when his word wasn't enough. What couldn't be said was kept silent, a thought. Raimundo never became a family man or owned any land. He pulled up his roots, carrying the letter in his shirt pocket. A whole letter, one word after another, how many of them? Sending a letter to someone who can't read, imagine that. The tip of the pencil hovered over the line. The next name was the one of the person who'd written the letter 52 years ago. Next to the notebook, the hardened envelope, still sealed. Raimundo never let anyone read it, and it grew old. And he grew old, wishing to know what it said. The desire growing with him, an elderly fetus, late blooming, a lifetime kept in that letter. Thank you. Hola. ¿Qué es sobredosis? Mi mamá reci recién se había bañado y estaba en el tocador, desenredándose su largo pelo con una peineta de dientes separados. Yo, detrás de ella en el reflejo, con una mancha de jugo de mora en la camisa blanca del uniforme, me veía acalorada. Ella fresca y yo sudorosa, como si viviéramos en países distintos. Es cuando alguien toma drogas de más y se muere a veces, por accidente o a propósito, porque alguien lo haría a propósito. Papá, hay gente que no quiere vivir. Era domingo y Cali estaba desolada, toda para nosotros. ¿Gente que no quiere vivir? Mi mamá me dijo, ¿te dijo que había gente que no quería vivir? Como Karen Carpenter, que se mató de hambre. Estábamos frente a la desembocadura del río Aguacatal. ¿Tu mamá te dijo eso? Sí. La Carpenter tenía una enfermedad. El río Cali corría manso por entre las rocas. La princesa Grace de Mónaco se tiró por un barranco. Fue un accidente. ¿Cómo sabes? Lo dijeron en las noticias. ¿Y Natalie Wood? Un accidente también. ¿Lo dijeron en las noticias? Sí. 
El aguacatal, más pequeño, estaba, entraba tímido, como si no quisiera molestar. ¿Vos alguna vez te has querido matar? Dije, no. Mi papá, que había tenido la vista al frente, en el muro de piedra de la casona entre los ríos, me miró. ¿Vos? Tampoco. Sonrió. ¿Y mi mamá? Dije con una voz chiquitica como la del aguacatal. Claro que no, aseguró. Yo no conozco a nadie que se quiera matar. También sonreí y corrí al árbol del tronco tendido para escalarlo. Entonces, Gloria Inés se mató. What's an overdose? Mama had just taken a bath and was at her dressing table, detangling her long hair with a wide tooth comb. Behind her in the reflection, a blackberry juice stain on my white uniform. I looked overheated. Her, fresh. Me, sweaty, like we lived in two different countries. She turned around to tell me, it's when someone takes too many drugs. And they die? Sometimes by accident or on purpose. Why would somebody do that on purpose? Scene change. Papa, are there people who don't want to live? It was Sunday and Kali was deserted, all for us. People who don't want to live. Mama said, she told you there were people who didn't want to live? Like Karen Carpenter, she killed herself by starvation. We were standing at the mouth of the Aguacatal River. Your mother told you that? Yes. The carpenter woman had a disease. The waters of the Kali flowed gently between the rocks. Well, Princess Grace of Monaco drove off a cliff. That was an accident. How do you know? They said it on the news. What about Natalie Wood? Also an accident. They said it on the news? Yes. The smaller Aguacatal joined the Kali River timidly, as though attempting not to make a fuss. Have you ever wanted to kill yourself? I asked. No. My father, whose gaze was fixed straight ahead at the stone wall, turned and looked at me. You? Me either. He smiled. What about Mama? I asked, my voice as small as the Aguacatal. Of course not, he assured me. I don't know anyone who wants to kill themselves. And I smiled too and ran off to climb the tree with the horizontal trunk. Then Gloria Inés killed herself. Hoewel ik van de oorlog alleen de bijtend zoete, ingeblikte chocolademelk proefde, was mijn moeder doodsbang de reis per prinses Wilhelmina te maken vanwege het oorverdovende militaire materieel dat onophoudelijk boven de kust patrouilleerde en, zoals werd verteld, wel een verkeerd schip tot zinken bracht. We gingen binnendoor. Mijn vader, niet in staat haar willen en weigeren te beïnvloeden, richtte dus zijn protest op mij. Als je per se 
in deze tijd naar je zuster moet, goed. Maar laat mijn kind thuis. Mijn kind. Schamper had ze gelachen en met ludieke koppigheid ons goed in twee aparte koffers gepakt. Met hoge wenkbrauwen had hij zijn leren dienstkoffer voor de dag gehaald, omdat reizen met één koffer makkelijker zou zijn. Met geveinsde vriendelijkheid duwden ze hem die weer in de armen. Iedereen eigen koffer kwam haar beter uit. Hoofdschuddend had hij ons vanaf de brede stijger nagekeken. Zijn groene pet in de hand, loodrecht, dun. Ik had niet durven wuiven. De volgende dag, bij het ontbijt van koude cassave en knapperige haring aan een van de volle scheepstafels, werd mij het een en ander duidelijk gemaakt. Voor de eerste zes dagen zou ik worden achtergelaten bij een goede kennis in de vesting. Zij zou bij familie in Guyana zijn. Wie is die goede kennis? Waarom reis jij alleen verder? Protesteerde ik. Ze keek naar me, zoals ze vaak naar haar echtgenoot had gekeken, met een blik van, wie denk je wel dat je bent? En ze zei onverschillig, wees aardig voor Lady Morgan, help waar mogelijk, ga vroeg naar bed, stel me geen vragen hierover, begrepen? Ik had geknikt met een enorme brok in de keel en geprobeerd haar die ontrafelende blik terug te werpen. Maar we kwamen alleen tot het stochtelijk lachen. Although my only taste of the war was the piercing sweet flavor of canned chocolate milk, my mother was scared to death of making the journey on the Princess Wilhelmina because of the deafening military aircraft that continually patrolled the coast and, so it was said, occasionally sank the wrong ship. We headed inside. My father, unable to sway her towing and froing, focused his objections around me. If you absolutely must visit your sister at a time like this, so be it. But leave my child at home. My child, she cackled, and putting on a show of stubbornness, packed our things in two separate suitcases. Eyebrows raised, he brought out his leather military satchel, saying that traveling with a single bag would be easier. With only a veneer of courtesy, she shoved it back into his arms, each having her own bag suited her better. He shook his head as he watched us go from the wide pier, his green hat in hand, straight-backed, thin. I didn't dare wave. The next day, over a breakfast of cold cassava and fried herring at a crowded table in the ship's mess, she made a few things clear to me. For the first six days, I'd be left with a close acquaintance in New Nickety. She'd be with family in Guyana. Who is this close friend, and why are you going on without me? I grumbled. She looked at me, the same way she'd often looked at her husband, with a, who the hell do you think you are expression, and said coolly, be nice to Lady Morgan, help out if you can, go to bed early, don't ask me any questions about this, got it? I nodded with a giant lump in my throat and attempted to toss back as composed a look at her, but we only burst out into hearty laughter. Thank you. Thank you. To our extraordinary readers and translators, we're going to take a brief intermission, a reminder that books are for sale, and we'll begin promptly in 10 minutes. Thank you. 
Welcome back. It's my pleasure now to introduce the finalists for the 2023 National Book Award for Poetry. John Lee Clark joined on stage with pro-tactile interpreters. Craig. <laughs> Craig Santos Perez. <laughs> Evie Shockley. <laughs> Brandon Sum. <laughs> and Monica Yoon. And now please welcome John Lee Clark to the stage. All right, I have Yalitza on my right hand side and Christina on my left and Leona flanking me at my left. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so thrilled both of you were able to be here with me this evening at this prestigious ceremony. You know, Christina Hartman, is a student in the Masters of Fine Arts program at Vermont College of Fine Arts. Yalitza Nuccio is founder of Tactile Communications. So thrilled to have you both here. Leona Godin, thank you also for joining. Leona is a scholar, a performer, and author of Their Plant Eyes. We also have co-navigator and voice interpreter, Halleen Anderson, and Aiko and Maria joining as well. Maria, come on out, let me feel you. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks for being here tonight. Maria Becerra. All right. We have gathered here this evening all together. We have made a journey. But I want to ask both of you, Yelitsa and Christina, I've heard that a crowd has gathered among us. But let me ask you, how do we know the crowd is here? How do we know there are others in our midst? We don't. We can't feel them, certainly. Can we? How could you make yourselves felt? Stomp, folks, stomp. Let's see, can you make yourselves felt? Can you shake up the structure? <laughs> okay, thank you. So that stomping, that will not be the first time you stomp this evening, I hope. We can all find ways, all find ways to shake things up. So when I stomp this evening, I invite you all to stomp along with me. And tonight, I'm going to be sharing in spoken protactile, a movement of the moment. OK? So again, when you see us stomp, you hear us stomp. You can't feel a stomp, maybe, but you can feel stomping when you all participate by stomping, OK? So we can share in the reverberations, OK? So when I stomp, you stomp. Yes, OK. Now, Christina, I would like to inquire into how you came to be here this evening. From Pennsylvania, it was a, a bit of a journey, a hop skip, OK? And 
do you, tell us how you got to be here. What was your method of transport? And Christina says, okay, give me a hand shaped like a, a C or a cup. What I did was, I took this C that is like the shape of my protactile name, and my protactile name goes around in a circle, and then a precise dot, exacting, is my protactile name translated. And I started off with a cup of coffee that was round like my name, and I drank it to the bottom, to the point at the bottom. So John says, yes, fantastic. So playing with language, that's what we do. And moving from sometimes an English letter to a shape, to a form, to a translation into another form. So Christina, you started with that drip, that last drip of coffee, that point in the center of the sea circular cup, and you circled above on the plane in route around, swirling, sweeping over, over countryside, over hill, over mountain. And you know, below you, as you approached the tarmac, in a crack was a bud. It was a shoot, really. It was something winding its way toward the sun. In the wind, it was blown. It shook. It shivered. As you circled above, as you neared in the metal bird, that single bloom opened, and the nose of the metal bird touched down just in the cup, held in the cup aloft, and you, Christina, jumped to the edge, <laughs> hung on, and descended to the ramp <laughs> where you stomped your first stomp and descended upon New York City. Yelitsa Nuccio, I put my hands on my hips because you, my dear, you were late. <laughs> Christina and I arrived early, okay? We came in right around 11, 11.30, and we've been sweating and fretting, not knowing where is our third, where is our third we, Yalitza. And Yalitza says, well, I was on the other side of the country. I started uh, against the Pacific while well, you were already here at the Atlantic side. So I put my hands on my hips because you made me travel the furthest, John. And John says, no, no, okay. Still, though, I understand why you were the latest to arrive. Because your protactile name, Yelitsa, is Sun Within. So you didn't have a simple, straightforward, linear journey across the country. In fact, you leaped through space. You rocketed up through the atmosphere into cold, cold black space. You felt the vibrations, and then there was not just the Earth below you, there were other planets spinning. Other planets spinning. Sun within sun. Sun, tangled in sun, you approached Venus. V E N U S. You gave it a whiff and you moved on immediately. Not interested in staying, you moved on to a warmer planet, to Mercury, spinning M-E-R-C-U-R-Y. And you put a finger to hot, 
mercury. Mercury still didn't satisfy your thirst for the universe, Yelitsa. So you ventured further into stars, into stardust, until you felt your own molecules, your own structure start to shake and shimmy in space, start to dissolve and blend into the atmospheres. Then you got a real taste. And just as you were approaching satisfaction until you were hand in hand, grasped in the interstices of, <laughs> of space time, you had to unravel yourself from that. And you had to pull yourself back. You had to reel yourself in. You had to come back to descend on Earth and on New York City. So I understand and forgive you that journey. <laughs> We, we, we are here. We, in the collective, we biked, we drove cars, we motorcycled, we rode, we paddled. Mm -hmm. Maybe we rode on horseback. <laughs> we tunneled. Maybe we took the subway. We went under, over, against, with, alongside. We anted through the vertical ant hill that we call this university to join here tonight in celebration. And we, 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 we are here. Thank you both, and Leona for joining me this evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Hafadei Toldo Samzu, uh, greetings everyone. Sainama Maasi, thank you to the National Book Foundation for uh, such an honor. And Sainama Maasi to all my fellow finalists for your inspiring readings tonight. I want to dedicate my reading uh, to two people in the audience. Uh, one is my partner, Olivia, for uh, supporting my work. And the other is uh, to my mom uh, for instilling a love of, of reading and writing uh, from a young age. So. I love you both so much. Thank you for, for coming on this journey with me tonight. Uh, so my book uh, takes place uh, on the island of Guam, which is uh, my homeland. And it's a very small island and often does not appear on, on most maps. Uh, this poem I'm going to share is called Off Island Chamorros. Uh, Chamorros is the name of my people. And Off Island Chamorros is, is how we refer to those who leave. Off-Island Chamorros. My family migrated from Guam to California when I was 15 years old. During the first day at my new high school, the homeroom teacher asked where I was from. The Mariana Islands, I answered. He replied, I've never heard of that place. Prove it exists. Yet when I stepped in front of the world map on the wall, it transformed into a mirror. The Pacific Ocean, like my body, was split in two and flayed to the margins. I found Australia, then the Philippines, then Japan. I pointed to an empty space between them and said, I'm from this invisible archipelago. My classmates laughed. 
And even though I descend from oceanic navigators, I felt so lost, shipwrecked on the coast of a strange continent. Are you a citizen, he probed. Yes, my island Guam is a US territory. We attend American schools, eat American food, listen to American music, watch American movies, play American sports, learn American history, dream American dreams, and die in American wars. You speak English well, he proclaimed, with almost no accent. And isn't that what it means to be a diasporic Chamorro, to feel foreign in a domestic sense? Over the last 50 years, my people have migrated to escape the violent memories of war, to seek jobs, schools, hospitals, adventure, and love. But most of all, we've migrated for military service, deployed and stationed to bases around the world. According to the 2010 census, 44,000 Chamorros live in California, 15,000 in Washington, 10,000 in Texas, 7,000 in Hawaii, and 70,000 more in every other state. We are the most geographically dispersed Pacific Islander population within the US, and off-island Chamorros now outnumber our on-island kin with generations having been born away from our ancestral homelands, including my daughters. Some of us will be able to return home for holidays, weddings, and funerals. Others won't be able to afford the expensive plane ticket to the Western Pacific. Years and even decades might pass between trips, and each visit will feel too short. We'll lose contact with family and friends, and the island will continue to change until it becomes unfamiliar to us. And isn't that, too, what it means to be a diasporic Chamorro, to feel foreign in our own homeland? After 25 years away, there are still times I feel adrift, without itinerary or destination. When I wonder, what if my family stayed? What if I return? When the undertow of these questions begin pulling me out to sea, remember, migration flows through our blood like the aerial roots of the banyan tree. Remember, our ancestors taught us how to carry our culture in the canoes of our bodies. Remember, our people, scattered like stars, form new constellations when we gather. Remember, home is not simply a house, village, or island. Home is an archipelago of belonging. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you for all the beautiful readings we've had so far. Um, this poem uh, takes its title from the name of a town uh, in France, Les Mille. Uh, and I think the only thing I need to add to that is that Mille is also the word for thousands in French. Pour les deux mille plus, site mémorial du Camp des Mille. Les Mille. There is no poem unless I, we, can find the courage to speak. In the middle of a vacation in the south of France, a chance to visit a World War II detention center arises, dusty, and bleak, just outside Aix-en-Provence, just past the scent of lavender in an ancient heat. The first thing you see and the last thing you visit is a boxcar. You know what it means. It takes the same toll on the breath, the pulse, as the rusted shackles displayed in another damned museum. 
there are histories of torture preserved all around us, formally, officially, with placards and institutional funding, casually, quietly, unavoidably, in the quality of a glance, the poverty of an existence, the demographics of a mall, a church, a prison. In a former tile factory, we learn again how anything can be misused, how anyone can be abused. A kiln is not a dormitory until it is. Here, there, slept people who were too Jewish to be German, too German to be French, too despised and feared to be defended, even by those who feared they, we, might soon be despised. If I now say Palestine, have I forgotten Auschwitz? If I say settlements, have I now forgotten camps? If I don't say Palestine, have I forgotten Elmina, Selma, Cape Town, Haiti? Must every place name on earth be a shorthand for violence on a map of grief? Orlando, Charleston, Wounded Knee, Sharpville, Gettysburg, Tiananmen Square, Gaza, Kachin, Plaza de Mayo, Soweto, Dominican Republic, Hiroshima, Srebrenica, Rwanda, Cambodia, Ankara, Adana, Odessa, Nanking. Yesterday and yesterday's yesterday, the planet pushing up sycamores and lavender, rice and plantains, fertilized with lead and blood, with rain from poisonous clouds and the dust that becomes of the dead. Adam, whose name means clay, was not baked in a kiln. Eve's name means life, implies the day that follows. Will tomorrow be a place we can name after something that grows? What is the proper use of a wall? There are so many histories buried in the space and silence around within these words. These lines make a poor but portable museum, a set of sketches, palimpsests, faint and painfully incomplete, that map the territory of the human with arrows pointing in every direction, some leading from you, some leading to you. There is no poem unless you, we, can find the courage to hear. Thank you. Congratulations to all the finalists. It's an extraordinary honor to be um, reading with you this evening. 
I'm going to read a poem from my book, Tripas. It's a poem titled Antenna. Tuning not lute, but car radio. Cocteau's Orpheus copies the broadcasts from a netherworld for verses. His muse a circuitry my grandmother inspected nights at Motorola. Before her shift, she put me to bed, laid down beside me, and smoked parliaments. Each drag like tower light to planes overhead. From crest to crest is wavelength and frequency the number per second. Where the waves won't reach, we call shadow. Count the radio's components like prosody, diodes, triodes, tetrodes, and dial the frequency in meters. Jack Spicer cited quasars, quasi-stellar radio, traveling light years as possible sources. I remember Orion, one slick matador, Theo called him, up on South Mountain, leaning on towers red-eyed with warning, and somehow, by frequency, by transmissions I vaguely knew, drunk with music. With ham operator, Paulina Oliveros sent a hello to the moon's tympanum. It bounced back, dropped in pitch by Doppler effect, and she accompanied the sound on accordion. Anana is lullaby, cradle song. I tell my mom, Anana now, and we talk about how neither of us had heard that before. Cancion de cuna, the lacuna we hum and tune by. Its tonic note, accord not, we worry, and tease on with night song. One grandmother with Vicks, one with Tiger Balm, rubbed fires of camphor and mint, old poultices into my chest. Their palms kneading and wet with salve, its menthols to strip the chaff and rattle in a night wheeze. Can you hear their lullabies? One like the dicho chiquito pero picoso. One in all five tones of village dialect with wish hum for thresholds. They put to bed each name for the night. In Cocteau's version, Orpheus crosses over through a tailor's mirror. The carnival house optics of Marx's commodity fetish, I thought, or my father in Phoenix, stocking the reach-in with old Milwaukee and seeing in the glass a brief moment his own reflection. Aigu tells me great-grandfather frequented Chinatown fortune tellers, ones with charts and calendars, a crystal ball almanac for a paper sun on a paper path a celestial divination in the back room of butcher or herbal shop or a corner store like our own, where Till Bell drifted back to find Ying Ying, her walk kicking spark off stove flame, or find me at a desk, my father fashioned from Schlitz 12 packs for weekends homework, me copying out my name, a dotted line running through its center, and not knowing the silences, not knowing then the cost of turning back to see. In today's news, US troops install the miles of border razor wire, so-called concertina, for the coil that extends and flattens like the bellows of a squeeze box. Listen 
to everything all the time and remind yourself when you are not listening, instructed Oliveros, a composer of sonospherics, a Qigong student of quantum physics. In practicing, she once explained, I have experienced listening with the palms of my hand. Thank you. Little baton hand up there. Um, hi, I'm Monica Yoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to read two poems, uh, both of which are parables of magpies. Um, magpie has always fascinated me, both as a bird and as a symbol, um, because in most European traditions, the magpie is thought of as a thief, um, obsessed with shiny objects, which is a belief that has no basis in fact, um, or even suspected of uh, drinking blood, drinking cattle's blood, which almost led to its extinction in, um, in the US. Uh, but in East Asian traditions, um, the magpie is considered a harbinger of good luck, friend to lovers, champion of the common people, and uh, it is the, one of the traditional symbols of Korea. Parable of the Magpie and the Trap. A certain magpie was caught in a wire mesh trap, and the trap was small, and the magpie could not fly, neither could it stretch out its black wings. And the trap held no food, nor did it hold water. And the magpie was hungry and thirsty in the shallowless sun. And then the hunter came, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for I am no food for you, and my meat is stringy and foul in the mouth. But the hunter put food and water for the magpie in the trap. Then the hunter went away. And then the cold rains came, and the wind, and the magpie huddled in the trap, and the magpie could not dry its feathers, nor was there any dry place for the magpie to rest its feet. And the hunter returned, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for you cannot sell my feathers, for my black feathers are not beautiful, and neither are they proof against the wind and rain. But the hunter placed a stick in the trap as a perch for the magpie and placed a roof on the trap to shelter the magpie. And then the hunter went away. And the trap was on the ground and the coming night was near and the predators began to wake in the shadows of the woods and therefore the magpie was afraid. And the hunter returned and the magpie said, hunter, you should release me from this trap for I am no threat to you nor do I prey upon your beasts, nor do I feed upon your gardens or your crops. But the hunter placed a larger trap around the smaller trap and turned to go away. And the magpie cried, hunter, you must release me from this trap, for no animal preys on me, so therefore I am not bait for any quarry you might wish to trap and kill. Now the hunter spoke and said, magpie, Others will not come for you to eat you. Others will come for you to attack you and to drive you from their lands. For know now, magpie, that you are not bait because you are wanted, but you are bait because you are hated. And it is because you are hated that therefore you are valuable to me. And the magpie cried and said, Hunter, what quarry is it that you so wish to trap and kill? And the hunter said, magpies. And then the hunter went away. Um, <clears throat> one very short poem. Um, uh, just an explanatory note. Pica is a medical disorder, uh, which is common, uh, most common in pregnant women, in which the patient has a compulsion to eat things with no nutritional value, uh, most commonly clay or rocks or bits of metal or fabric. Um, and it's named after the magpie's scientific name, pica pica, since magpies are supposed to eat anything. Um, parable of the magpie's name, pica pica. Who was it who 
taught you to want what will not feed you that you can not make a house by eating a wall. Thank you. I'm delighted to welcome our finalist for the 2023 National Book Award for Nonfiction, Ned Blackhawk. <laughs> Christina Rivera Garza. <laughs> Teju Cole, reader for Raja Shahadi. Christina Sharp. And John Valiant. Please welcome Ned Blackhawk. It's my extreme honor and privilege to be here this evening. I'm Ned Blackhawk, um, the author of The Rediscovery of America, Native Peoples and the Unmaking of U.S. History, which begins, how can a nation founded on the homelands of dispossessed indigenous peoples be the world's most exemplary democracy? This question haunts America. If history provides the common soil for a nation's growth and a window into its future, it is time to reimagine U.S. history outside the tropes of discovery. For centuries, America and the New World have been ideas, synonyms that convey a sense of wonder and possibility made manifest by discovery, a historical act in which explorers are the protagonists. They are its actors and subjects. They think and name, conquer and settle, govern and own. Indigenous absence has been a long tradition of American historical analysis. Building upon a generation of recent scholarship, this book draws upon an outpouring of study that has made indigenous history a growing field. Its argument is simple. A full telling of American history must account for the dynamics of struggle, survival, and resurgence that frame America's indigenous past. Existing paradigms of US history remain incomplete when they fail to engage Native America. Notwithstanding its growth, Native American history remains encumbered by many challenges. The habits of previous generations remain calcified. College textbooks, campuses, public memorials continue to exclude Native people. A reorientation of U.S. history is needed for many reasons. We need to build a more inclusive narrative, and this cannot be accomplished by simply adding new cast members to the dramas of the past. Our history must reckon with the fact that indigenous peoples, African Americans, and millions of other non-white citizens have not enjoyed the self-evident truths of equality, life, and liberty proclaimed at the founding. Native peoples were not granted US citizenship until 1924, by which time the federal government had seized hundreds of millions of acres of land from Native nations and over 300 treaties. Tens of thousands of Native peoples were killed by settler militias and U.S. armed forces during the Civil War era, and government-sponsored campaigns of child removal resulted in 40% of Indian children forcibly separated from their families and taken to boarding schools by 1928. Pervasive violence and dispossession are more than mere sidebars or parentheses in American history they call into question its central thesis. 
The exclusion of Native Americans was codified into the Constitution, maintained throughout the antebellum era, and legislated into the 20th century. And far from being incidental, it enabled the development of the United States. U.S. history as we currently know it does not account for the centrality of Native Americans. In the American Book of Genesis, we are told in a recent best-selling history of the United States, liberty and slavery became the American Cain and Abel. But can we imagine an American Eden that is not cultivated by its indigenous caretakers? Exiled from the American origin story, Native peoples await the telling of a history that includes them. It was their garden homelands, after all, that birthed America. Buenas noches. In Liliana's Invincible Summer, I, I explored the femicide of Liliana Rivera Garza, my younger sister, which occurred on July 16, 1990. The book includes notes and letters written by Liliana, and I'm gonna be reading a section of one of them tonight. I will add something else at the end. This is the last page of my notebook. Well, the first one from back to front. You know what I mean? Depending on how you look at it because it is a matter of thinking young. It is a matter of thinking positively, a matter of focus. Don't you like that ad? Oh well, I do. Too bad. I am in such a completely lazy mood, and I'm very sleepy too. And when you suffer from those two conditions, but nevertheless, you also have an aversion to sleep during wake hours, there is this big shock. And do you know what happens? Well, in addition to sleepiness and laziness, a very funny foolishness crops up. That is happening to me right now. So much so that you even feel like sitting down or laying down or kneeling just about anywhere. And then it just so happens that you inevitably start thinking and thinking and you turn to look at the clock on the wall and you think that your mother is going to arrive soon and that you have to pay your school tuition bill and that today you didn't see Angel and you don't like you don't feel like training. You also think that you no, long, no longer want to train because when you are not in a quiet environment, it is impossible for you to develop your concentration and full physical potential. And you think that your exams are almost here, and above all, you worry, but your worry is not big enough for you to get up, grab your notebook, and study, right? Well, Something similar happens when you are like this because it's something exactly like that, huh? And if you don't know how to express what you are thinking, then something happens that seems very strange to you. It is something like wondering if you really are the one who is writing, as if, and suddenly, as if by magic, you remember a dream and as soon as it arrives, it just goes away and you forget it. And you're even more sleepy now and more. And ouch, your back itches, you scratch with fury because it bothers you that you can't scratch comfortably. Jeez, and you wonder why they put so much chlorine in the pool. It makes my skin so very dry. And dryness is not the worst, but what your dry skin gives off itching. So you keep on thinking about the swimming pool and the chlorine, which in addition to the itching, leaves a characteristic smell of the so-called substance whose chemical symbol is CL. And then you remember your chemistry class and something else is as a result, but it is nauseating and you prefer to leave it in peace. Peace. Damn. 
What if there was peace? What if there were no people starving in the world? What if there was justice? What if people really appreciated other people for who they are and not for what they look like or their image? What if I fell asleep? What if you knew what would become of me? You are never more defenseless than when you are rendered speechless. Who in that summer of 1990 could have said with their head held high with the strength conferred by the conviction of being right and truthful, it was not her fault, nor did it matter where she was or how she dressed. Who, in a world where the word femicide did not exist, the term intimate terrorism did not exist, could have said what I now say without the slightest doubt, the only difference between my sister and me is that I never came across a murderer. The only difference between you and her. Thank you. It's an honor and a wonder to be here tonight. Thank you. Note 169, Tender. When Claudia Tate interviewed Gail Jones for Black American Literature Forum, she asked, do you have any theories about the human condition which you dramatize in your work? To which Jones replied, I think what comes out in my work in those particular novels, Corregidora and Eva's Man, is an emphasis on brutality. But I think that something else is also suggested in them, namely the alternative to brutality, which is tenderness. Although the main focus is on the blues relationships or relationships involving brutality, there seems to be a growing understanding working itself out, especially in Corregidora, of what is required in order to be genuinely tender. Perhaps brutality enables one to recognize what tenderness is, end quote. Tender. The girl who wrote on the chalkboard. The boy who was carrying Skittles and iced tea the girl who was by herself and surrounded by hate, the young woman who was asleep in her bed, the young woman who drove the wrong way and the baby girl who survived this, the man who cried for his mother, the girl who took the video of the man who cried for his mother, the other girl, the cousin of the first girl who also witnessed this, the boy who was skipping away. The woman convulsed with mourning and the woman who warned them not to take her picture. The girl who told her mother that she would take care of her. The boy who had only just arrived at the gazebo to play. The girl who was sound asleep in her grandmother's living room. The girl to whose forehead someone taped the word ship. The woman who questioned why she was being stopped. The woman pulled over with her three young children in the car. The woman who knocked on a door and asked for help. The boy who was walking down the street. The woman whose two little sons were swept away in a flood the door to their safety barred, the man who was running down the street, the boy who was playing music in his car with his friends, the boy whose mother was anxious when he did not return home, the woman who fell, the girl who called for help, the man who yelled, mom, mom, the man who said, I can't breathe, 
the boy accused of shoplifting and his mother whose heart was broken, the man who said, I'm scared, the girl's sisters whose bones became lessons, the girl who emerged from the rubble and asked, are you taking me to the cemetery? The doctors and nurses working without bandages, without anesthesia, without safety. The children who held a press conference in English and said, we want to live. The girl who said, I am a child. Raja, my friend, is in Ramallah and uh, couldn't be here tonight for the reasons that you know. I'm honored and saddened to be standing here in his stead. This is from We Could Have Been Friends, My Father and I, a Palestinian memoir. Now, over half a century later, with Israel in full control of the Palestinian population living in Israel itself and in the occupied territories, I want to tell my father that history may have proved him wrong, that perhaps his was but an empty threat and Israel must have known it. The occupier has seemingly won. The word occupation has been dropped from Israel's vocabulary. The curriculum taught in their schools tells their students that the whole of greater Israel is theirs and that the Palestinians have no rights over that land. I want to say to him, you underestimated Israel's power, resourcefulness, and long-term planning. The conversation is continuing and my father answers me. Do you really believe it was inevitable that history should have taken that course and that it couldn't have been otherwise. Of course not. It was all a consequence of the two sides refusing to recognize each other's existence. It could have been otherwise. When I raised the prospect of violence ensuing if Israel did not pursue the course of peace, I knew it was an empty threat. I had no illusions about the capabilities of our people in the occupied territories who had been under the harsh regime of Jordan for 19 years and had nothing with which to fight Israel. Yet, to Israel, the possibility that it might fail to control over the over a million Palestinians who came under its rule was a real cause for worry. The threat was made at a time when to them this was a real fear. And so I tried to convince them that peace is the better course to follow and to urge them to accept our proposal for a Palestinian state. You say they've won and you cite the fact that they deny the Palestinians have any rights over the land and have dropped you out of their consciousness. This only means that they've succeeded in deceiving you as well. You think that because they've made you invisible, they've won? It pains me to hear you put it like that. This is a recipe for perpetual war. Don't you realize that the only victory is the achievement of peace between our two peoples? How it saddens me to see that the only relations between you are those of master and slave, one of exploitation, hatred, seizing every opportunity to destroy each other. And yet you call their denial of Palestinians their victory. Just think how much time Israel has wasted learning the tricks of interrogation, repression, and other coercive ways to control the Palestinian population under their rule. Of course, they had the best masters to teach them, the Inglés, who left them their brutal methods of torture, house demolitions, and deportation, all enshrined in laws such as the Defense Emergency Regulations, 
which Israel found ready and used extensively over the years. True, they've managed to control the Palestinians and in the process incarcerated many thousands who ended up despising Israel more than ever and determined to keep fighting it. But then the two nations are now further apart than ever. Has any of this brought peace any closer? And I reply, of course not. Yet still the fact is that they won. To them, it's a war to destroy the Palestinians, deny their existence and rights to the land. And they did it, they won. And that's all that matters to them. As to the cost, it was much, much higher for us than for them, nothing to compare. They lost thousands of soldiers, we lost many more and still remain stateless. Then he tells me, the cost they bore goes far beyond the number of dead in the course of the numerous wars they waged. Loss of life was only part of it. How much better things would have turned out had they used their superior skills and resources to help develop the region rather than continually destroying it. That's their choice, I say, a choice they could make because they won. And he says, the only real victory is when we've both won. Nonfiction is a rugged category, so not for, not for the faint of heart. Uh, I am really simultaneously uh, proud and sobered uh, and really happy to be here all at once. Uh, this um, short section is set in Fort McMurray, Alberta, and Fort McMurray is uh, a petroleum boom town uh, set in Alberta. Uh, Canada, 600 miles north of the U.S. border in the boreal forest, and what's going on up there is the largest, most egregiously wasteful and destructive petroleum recovery project on Earth. And, and what they do up there is mine and melt bituminous sand, and then they render it with colossal quantities of natural gas into a low-grade petroleum product that they sell at a discount to the U.S. market. And in May uh, 2016, the city of Fort McMurray was overrun by a wildfire that triggered the largest, most rapid evacuation due to fire in modern times. And uh, this is why. In some cases, homeowners had their phones linked to security cameras and these revealed the fire's behavior from points of view unseeable and unsurvivable by human eyes. In one video, taken from a nanny cam in an upstairs living room, the point of view presents an inviting sofa flanked by end tables with lamps and photos on them. To the left is a cabinet with a fish tank on it, and next to that is a plate glass window. Everything appears to be in order. The lamps are lit and so is the fish tank, but something's outside the window. Vague shapes race past in flickering shades of gray, but it's impossible to see what or who they might be. As the movement by the window intensifies, so does the contrast until it is clearly smoke, pressing up against the glass before racing on light to dark and back again. A faint crackling can now be heard. This sound, combined with those restless clouds so close against the window, gives the impression of a motivated presence just outside. There is a bang, and a few sparks flicker past the window. Another bang, louder this time, and a piece of something, a gutter, vinyl siding, 
drops across the window, followed by louder bangs and more strips of siding. And then the fire is there, bobbing this way and that, like it's trying to see inside the room. The window, about four feet square, is triple paned for subarctic windows, uh, winters, and we can hear it cracking in the heat. The outermost pane gives way first and falls out with a crash. It's clear now that the fire is trying to get in. The fire punches through the second layer of glass, making the same sound and the same sized hole as a fist. There has been no three-dimensional intervention, only this vaporous spectral presence, and yet it is battering its way into the room. More glass is broken out until the last layer gives way. The smoke enters first, creeping up and across the ceiling as flames now probe the hole, darting in and out of the window a foot from the fish tank. Flash over when synthetically furnished rooms burst spontaneously into flame is now minutes or moments away. Smoke is rolling across the ceiling and into every corner. Even so, the fish tank remains visible, holding our attention because it holds living things left behind and because something, it's hard to tell what, is happening inside it. The smoke Thickening and darkening, crowds in, shrinking the room and blurring the details as the sofa ghosts in and out of view. The tank light is still on and so are the table lamps, their pale beams creating cones of visibility which feel now like zones of protection over the photos they illuminate. Everything around them grows increasingly opaque. The crackling grows sharper, more insistent. The fire is in the room now. Flames are brushing against the fish tank and sparks streak by in the turbulent air like bright leaves in a storm. There is a sizzling sound. The fish tank, the entire room, is now far past the boiling point. The nanny cam, pushed well beyond its design specifications, cuts to black. Scarcely five minutes have elapsed since the room was habitable. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And now, last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce the finalists for the 2023 National Book Award for Fiction. Nana Kwame Uje Brenya. <laughs> Alia Bilal. <laughs> Paul Harding. Hannah Pilvinen. And Justin Torres. And please welcome Nana Kwame Uje Brenya to the stage. How's it going, y'all? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think I'm only gonna read one of these. Uh, don't be broken up about it. Um, earlier today, my little sister told me she had finally got around to like really getting into my book. <laughs> Her review, at least a part of it was, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so I feel like I already won. Um, <laughs> but truly, I, uh, I feel extremely honored to be among these finalists, uh, like actually, uh, because of all that we've gone through, like I guess this week, I feel like it matters to stand with people who um, are willing to stand for something. 
And to that note, I'd also like to um, commend the National Book Foundation. Today they put out a statement, and to you as well, uh, thank you for your integrity. So. Some people have like no idea what I'm talking about. If you go on the internet, you could. <laughs> I can't get into it right now. I gotta. Um, I haven't read this before, so I'm gonna try something new. Uh, I, it requires your help. If I put my hand up, you guys think you could say something on command with me? You guys think you could do that? Yeah. Um, the word would be stacks. It's somebody's name, like S T A X X X. Let's practice. So, like one, two, three. Stacks. It's pretty good. Um, just like that, but like a little bit, you know. One, two, three. Yes. Love it. This is from a chapter, it's a short chapter called Colossal. Uh, my book is about an imagined future in which convicted wards of state can opt out of a sentence of at least 25 years and participate in death matches. It thinks about the brutal cars of our carceral, carceral state. And um, this section is from one of the characters who's like a star in these death matches games. Her name is Stax. Um, this is later in the book, and it, in this moment, she's kind of doing something like if The Rock did spoken word, I guess. <laughs> you call me Colossal. Come call me what you call me. Come, come call me to life. Call me now. Call me criminal, cold heart catastrophe. Call me uncalled, call me king, call me crazy. Even as you kill me, you call me killer. Call me, hear my name. Call me now. Yeah. Call me cold, call me kite. Call me candlelight kept. Call me Cain, call me Christ. Call me church of the creator. Call me what you call me. Yeah. Call it as it is. The life you give is death. The death I give is life, is love at least. So call me colossal, call me corrupt, call me clean, call me hurricane, yes. hurricane, yes. hurricane, yes. come call, come all, come call me complete. Thank you guys. Good evening. I will be reading a short passage from the short story Blue. And what's important to know about the protagonist of the story is that she's been hated her entire life for the crime of being born a very dark skinned woman in America. Martha walked farther along the street wanting to sit on a nearby park bench to rest her ankles, though she knew it would make her late. The Smiths were decent, aloof and distrusting, but reliable with their pay. And she didn't want to alter this circumstance by upsetting them with her tardiness. She only paused before what seemed to her an impromptu gathering at the corner of Fifth and Prospect Street. It was a large crowd of regular folks surrounding a small group of men who she saw intermittently through the weaving masses of pedestrians. One man stood before the others and Martha had to move to see him clearly. He was tall and slender, with skin that shimmered like polished bronze. He spoke a flurry of words that captivated the crowd enough to make the people stand and listen. Martha drew the ire of two women who she'd accidentally bumped on her way into a clearing. They wore cigarette pants with sleeveless button-up shirts and sunglasses looking her up and down, showing only slightly more disdain toward her than the speaker. 
They scowled as he went on, shaking their heads and even laughing out loud as he made his point. The sight of them, imperious and important looking, reminded Martha of her sweatiness and generally haggard appearance. And so she stepped away, leaning in closer to hear the suited man speak when he noticed her. His eyes went wide at the sight of her face and instantly she was afraid, growing even more so when he pointed in her direction and all of the onlookers turned their necks to see. This, this right here is the point and the reason I am speaking. We are living in the wilderness of North America. This land of misfits and misanthropes got you thinking day is night and night is day. Thinking right is wrong and wrong is A-OK. -okay. Some people in the crowd chuckled, entertained by the cadence. Got you all confused about yourself, making you wish you were something you are not. Walking around, knowing your mother looks like midnight, and won't dare to be seen arm in arm with a woman darker than a rubber band. You can follow what the white man tells you to think if you want to. But for me, I'm looking for the real thing. He said, his eyes fixed on Martha, a real original woman with none of the stain of old master's blood running in her veins. An original woman preserved and clean, a taste of chocolate sweetness out of a dream. An original woman, I want her hand. The good fruit grows in the darkest soil and not in the sand. I know that's the truth, a woman on the far side of the crowd yelled and tentative laughter followed. But Martha was drawn in, mesmerized by the bronze man who was still looking into her eyes. I need an original woman Blueberry, dark cherry. That's the only kind of woman who's sweet enough to marry. A woman held high, righteous, battle ready, sweet to the bone. That's the only kind of woman I plan to take home. Thank you. Thank you. It is um, just a thrilling and humbling privilege to be here with everybody tonight. Um, no introduction. My favorite introduction that I've ever heard to a reading or a song or anything was, this one goes like this. <laughs> Esther had heard a visiting relative once talk about going to a big reunion on her husband's side of the family. There were more than a hundred people, she'd said. Many of them looked exactly alike, but many of them you'd never tell were related. A family so big you had to have special reunions of them. They'd spread so far and wide. What it must have been like to have a family that large and get back together with them like that. Their family on the island was always so small and seemingly getting smaller, compacting, members converging into one another. So few of them, they'd begun to be more than one relation to one another at a time, men being their daughters, fathers, and husbands too, mothers being their sons, sisters, the family condensing, imploding, fewer and fewer people, becoming heavier and heavier until one last woman would stand dark and wholly compacted, herself begat, 
she her own mother, she her own daughter and sister, all in her one impossibly condensed and sorrowful body, leaden and involute. So when she lay down to die, no one would need to bury her. She would just sink into the ground like a millstone plunging through silty water. Not now, though. Now they were scattered to the sea, the asylum, the poorhouse. Ethan, God knew where, but not coming back, she was sure, although she'd never say so to her son. What a sight it would have been, Esther thought, looking at the island as if it were slipping away and not she. To see that last self-begotten woman, darker than pure dark, heavier than the whole world, standing on the bluff. And what a sight to see the island give way beneath her, as if to her impossible weight, granite and bedrock suddenly could, no, could give no more support than a silk scarf to a statue cast in lead plunging from the spangled, sparkling surface back into the lightless pith of the only womb left strong enough to bear her away to her next and truest birth. She knew how holy it was that one family went into the ark and came forth from it, and she knew how terrible it was, too. Thank you. The day of the earthquake was the darkest day of the year. This far north, what counted as day was just twilight stretched thin, so that no shadows fell and the steeple of the church made no impression on the snow, and the river and forest and hills were all suspended in the same half-finished light. The effect of this was a shared, if unexpressed, uneasiness, but most people were used to it. If given the choice, they would have said, let there be darkness, and gone back to their work. That was the sentiment, anyway, around people who had grown up here, Lars Levi among them. He found the cold and dark invigorating. He was a man of extremes, and so he was drawn to extremes. They suited him. They spurred him on. But even he had to admit the morning was off kilter somehow. He had dreamed the night before of something of importance, what he couldn't say, and it troubled him that he might have missed its message. He was a man who put credence in these things in the importance of what was felt, in part because his mother had been that way and in part because the land made everyone here that way. No one could live beneath the northern lights and the midnight sun and not come out of it sure there was something besides rationality at work, least of all Lars Levi, the pastor of this most northern parish for the past 22 years, a man of some hubris but not a man who could be accused of insincerity. He was here to preach. He believed in what he spoke, but today he was especially sure of his purpose, and the weight of that purpose made him anxious. He paced up and down the side aisle, inventing little tasks to check on. Had Henrik rung the bell? Had Willa made the fire in the stove? The church was filling up. It really was, the Finns in their usual places towards the front, while behind them were the Laplanders, the Laps, the Sami, whatever you called them. He used Lap when he spoke to the Swedes and Sami when he spoke to the Sami. And it occurred to Lars Levi that he was doing it. He had 829 parishioners stretched over 100 miles, and a good quarter of them were here. The Finns had skied for hours along the frozen river, and the Laps had harnessed their reindeer to the sledges, and they had driven 20, 40 miles through the snow to get here, to a tiny church village in Sweden, where 10 of the 40 inhabitants were his own family, to hear him speak, him, Lars Levi Lestadius, and made him smile to himself when he thought no one was looking. But had Henrik rung the bell? Thank you. Last one. 
It's too bad it's like really long. It's like so long. Just like get comfy. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. It's, it's super short, I swear. Uh, Blackouts is like a long conversation between a very young man and a much older man who's on his deathbed. And here the younger man is thinking back to the time they first met. At first, I'd known him by a false name. The nurses all called him Juan, John. <laughs> Only days later, after he broke our silence, did I notice his medical bracelet read Juan Gay, a name I found discordant, but also amusing. When I asked why the nurses did not use his real name, Juan explained that he'd been in and out of that place for decades. A few of the staff knew him from way back, a time when every even slightly foreign name was Americanized. The false name had carried over from the older nurses to the newer ones. Juan never much cared what they thought or what they called him. He never felt a need to correct the misapprehensions of others. Even then, I thought he'd seemed free, though of course, neither of us were allowed to venture any farther than the locked double doors at the end of the hall. Juan was deeply reserved and much older than the other patients, and I was deeply terrified and much younger. We sat side by side in a quiet corner on a pine bench, thickly glossed with turned and painted legs. At first, we did not speak very much. In our silent communion, we faced down the immense stretches of gray boredom. On occasion, the rebellious adolescent spirit might flare up, and I'd want to lash out, cause a scene. But I wanted more Juan's presence beside me, so I stayed quiet and still and used the edge of my thumbnail to carve a curse into the bench, pressing so hard my wrists throbbed in the night. Such a gentle old man. Later, I would learn all manner of vocabulary to think about sex and gender, but invoking any of those words would be anachronistic. I was a teenager from bumfuck nowhere. I saw only that Juan transcended what I thought I knew about sissies. When he spoke, he spoke an illusion, literarily, often pausing to check with a look whether I followed. I don't think he expected me to understand directly, but rather he wanted me to understand how little I knew about myself, that I was missing out on something grand, a subversive variant culture and inheritance. What a privilege it's been to listen to you all tonight. Thank you so much. One more round of applause, please, for our finalists. What gifts you've given us. Um, another thanks to our special guests, Teju Cole and Mateo Iskaripur, our fabulous ASL and ProTactile interpreters, NYU Skirball, and really useful media. A reminder that these incredible books are available for sale in the lobby until 10 p.m. with thanks to NYU Bookstore. And one more huge thank you to the National Book Foundation and to the NYU Creative Writing Program for making this evening possible, and to our wonderful audience, that's you, here at NYU Skirball, and all of you tuning in online for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you.